Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Welcome to the Indian Military History Podcast. I am Vikram Dalal. This is episode number five. And today we have with us a very, very special guest, a very senior officer from the Indian Army, Lieutenant General KJ Singh. Uh, honors AVSM, PVSM, and BAR. Did I, did I say that in the right format, sir? No, it should be said uh, PVSM, AVSM, and BAR. So, okay. but it, it is it is such a confusing thing. I have been to many fora where people say AVSM bar bar. So, you know, <laughs> they sort of, they can't make much out of it. What is this about? And okay. like uh, even our ranks, you know, yeah. like people sometimes call you lieutenant. Sometimes they call you <laughs> lieutenant oh, that, general. So oh, that's a, really okay. far it's off. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that is a pretty and, big mistake if and, someone's calling you lieutenant. And uh, I tell people, that you call me lieutenant, but give me my, you know, youth back, then I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, I, I think that would be a fair trade. Um, so yeah. you served in the army, so you served in the army for almost 40 years. That's, that's just an amazing, uh, I was going through your, uh, your uh, journey in the army. You commanded the 63rd Cavalry, 83rd Armored Regiment, uh, 33 Corps. I have my notes, so I'm so, sort of looking at that at the same time. And then you also commanded the Western Command, um, uh, in and then you retired in 2016. So see, from 19. 19- see, Vikram, Vikram, yes, I have to roll my story back. The story <laughs> okay. that I want to share, yes, sir, with your audience is that I used to live in a in a small town in Rajasthan. I used to go to a Hindi medium school, wow. and uh, my father was in administrative services there, state services. And he felt that I need to get out from there and take some kind of affordable public school edu- education. Yeah. So Sanic school came my way. So when I was about, you know, uh, how, how did our generation shape up? You know, if you see, look like the look yeah. at the whole thing that uh, 62 war, not much recollection, uh, but 65 had just happened when I wrote my exam for entering Senate school. Okay. And uh, 66, I joined, joined a Senate school in Chittod, which was quite some distance from where I lived. And at the age of 10 years, I was in a Senate school, which was also affordable public school. Your dad also went to one. Yes. And uh, so the Senate schools were very uh, Bharat, you know, they had a rural kind of a, uh, student base, uh, yeah. children who studied there came from villages and all. And I myself came from a small town kind of thing. Yep. And uh, basically, we are villagers. So uh, then, uh, you know, 65 war had taken place. And we used to be, you know, in our school, we used to fast on one day. India was in such a dire straits. People yeah. don't realize uh, what has happened since then. And uh, 71 war took place. I wrote my ND exam, more with the tribal kind of thing that everybody in my class is doing it and why shouldn't I do? And how am I less than them? So I went and uh, I remember your dad and me, we were in the same services selection board in Rurki. <laughs> so I have very fond memories of your dad. So now, uh, we, we went there and uh, I got through. And my parents told me, my mother especially, she said, see, 62 happened, 65 happened, 71 happened. Every five, six years, there's a war. Why do you want to take this thing? In in in, 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 in Punjabi, they say, why do you want to take this panga? Yeah. And But one, one took that. And then, since then, so I, when you say 40, I have to correct you that it's really 50. Because yes. I did Sanic school. Yes. Then NDA, then IMA. It was it was one one, you know, you had got on a roller coaster and you could get off it. It was like that. And yes. uh, when I came to army, uh, I chose to join Armored Corps. I had no connect with army. Mm-hmm. Nobody in my family had ever served in army, so there was huge big apprehension whether I'll be able to adjust there, and what will I make of that career. But Vikram, things happen. It's just that you're lucky, you find good environment, and you carry on. 
was there a specific reason why you chose armored core over uh, uh, armored over uh, infantry or any other services uh, basically see people will tell you those who have a army background they would know but i didn't know anything about army i mm. just thought that cavalry or armored core is very you know a cool very stylish you it know, does sound very you, you cool I, like I, 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 yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, i i thought you know you won't have to see uh, when i joined uh, army i thought that's the end of studies you know you won't have to study but uh, my dad is been in <laughs> administrative <laughs> services amount yeah. of courses i have done yeah. like uh, in army the number of you know i have done two mphils i have done an msc in defense studies so it's we when we choose our you know your generation is luckier you are well informed you have choices uh, we didn't have many choices and uh, that's how it was yeah i think uh, uh, speaking of sainik schools i think uh, the sainik school system plays a very important role for people to sort of come out of you know the rural background that they have and sort of uh you know get out there and get, have they, it gives them an opportunity to have a have a better life and i can see that with my dad and you know many other examples as well where they have been able to sort of uh really make a lot out of those opportunities that sainik school gave us gave them so uh it, it's a very valuable uh, uh institution i would say um the so to so, so, uh, when you joined the uh, armored core uh tanks so obviously tanks sound very cool what was the first tank type that you were trained on and you you were you started your service in 1977 right so i'm i'm, I'm assuming a lot of the tanks would be russian made we we had that time we had p55s and bjms these were the mm -hmm. two tanks and pt76 were in a very small numbers these were three tanks in our armored core that time i joined a t55 regiment or i like to correct myself a bit one or two regiments still had t54 which had come from russia so what india had done was that t55 had a 100 mm gun which was not a very reliable gun so what india did is india took the vijant gun one of 5 mm and yeah. it mated it on to the t55 platform which was called okay. upgunning from 100 or jugar basically it became yeah one of 5 mm yeah. so, but it was well well considered jugar with proper technical validation and all mm -hmm. it was not as if anybody who wanted it was done scientifically yeah. properly checked out and all uh, israelis uh, or some other country chose to call it india's bastard thing you know a tank oh, which is you know that's a horrible that name to call it uh, but uh, t55 was a very reliable tank mm -hmm. uh, my tank was 1685 i still remember the number in my troop there were three tanks uh, 1742 1685 and 1502 so, so every so I every tank tanks. has okay so uh, a, a troop of tank has three tanks in it that's what you said yes yes and each one has a number and mm -hmm. and it is got you know number is also starts with zx or yx okay. now now the air is being put our tanks it was zx and all mm -hmm. now the first two are letters signifying which year this tank was commissioned i see so that's how it is kept track of and would you believe it vikram when i was retiring my last day when i pulled out from my regiment was on the same time 1685 the tank was still in service yeah and it was it was uh, located by my staff it was in a neighboring place which is only 20 kilometers away so mm -hmm. it was brought up to my regiment and i was pulled out in that tank that See, is so cool those tanks quality control was very high order right. and sorry to say russian tanks which came in later like my my regiment uh, I, i had this t55 uh, yeah then i went to buy independence corps in my regiment they had pt76 
yep. it's got phased down. T55 got phased down. Now PT76 was an MCBS and light tank. Uh, so it is now being after the dark thing. India is after about uh, 25 odd years of not having any light tank or even more. We are now trying to make a light tank. We are making Zoraba, which is going to be a light tank. Uh, indigenous that work is going on. So it's, it's, it's assumed it will be made in two, three years' time. Mm -hmm. So let me just complete one thing. Uh, Quad Commission in T55 and Vigilance were there, then saw induction of T72s. I commanded my regiment with T72s, okay. by which time T90s were getting in. So I commanded first T90 Brigade. So wow. when I left Army, uh, surprisingly, all three were still in service. T55, because in India, a tank has a life of 40, 45, 50 years. Yeah. It, 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 it serves with frontline regiment, then it is given to headquarters, then it is given to uh, combat support elements like engineers, right. and it is carries on because it's not easy to replace. What, what would you say is the biggest difference between the T55s and T72 versus the T90? See, T55 was a tank which was very simple, basic. Mm -hmm. uh, it had a four man crew. It was around 40 tons. Then T72, Russians make a tank in an evolutionary manner. The same thing they take, they add a few things and they upgrade, but the configuration remains, uh, it grows on that one configuration. Okay. So T, they upgrade the engine also, they improve the transmission, but it's an evolutionary process. It's not okay. a revolutionary change suddenly. So T72 incorporated an auto load. So yep. crew got reduced from four to three. It, 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 you had an auto loader. See, auto loader gives you an advantage that loader is the only member of the crew who has to stand. Rest are sitting in seats. To load, you have to stand. Right. So to for a, for a person to stand, the height of the tank has to cater for a person to stand. Though oh. Russians, though, though Russians have laid down that their crews will be of a medium height. But India didn't have that luxury. We gave these regiments, these tanks to regiments which had Rajput, Chaks, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. were tall. You right. Know, we, we took, we, it's, it's, it, it, there are limitations of poor country. So right. then T72 uh, has an auto loop. So yeah. you don't have to have support man is gone. Its engine was of a higher order. And it, it had it had also laser range finder. It still has laser range finder. Its night vision device had improved. And then came T90. T90 was a further improvement. Uh, the range finder became better. And uh, today in a tank, it's not the speed, it's the optronics. About 40% yeah. of tanks' value is optronics. What kind of range finder you have, what kind of night vision device you put, what kind of navigation system you have. So that makes the value package of a tank. Right. So, uh, and you also mentioned the uh, Zorawa light tank that is coming up uh, in, the, in, the, in the next few years. And the reason for that is yeah. so that uh, we can improve our capability along the border regions uh, along China. Is there a specific reason why we need a light tank in that uh, at, see, at that see, height, is it? Light tank has got a uh, few criteria. See, what is light? Like, you can ask what is light. Traditionally, light tank is 28 tons or so and okay. And the tank should be able to float. It should be amphibious. But China fielded a tank of theirs, ZX, this tank, which is of 34 tons, and they are mm. calling it light. The Chinese can do anything. Right. They're Chinese. <laughs> so <laughs> when we saw Chinese tanks, we realized that we also need a light tank. Light tank is agile, air transportable. You can mm. you have oh, ideally I see. You have amphibious. Right. And and it, it doesn't damage those uh, roads 
which are difficult to build in so it will have rubber shoes and all so that you you don't damage the roads you can it's agile and uh, the protection is less uh, yes. because it's light so you have some other means and uh, in terms of the it's sorry go ahead gun also uh, normally gun is about 25 mm and you supplement it with a missile that's how you try to and the fire power on that so in in terms of the fire power is it equivalent to that of the heavier tanks or is that is a 105 mm a smaller gun i just don't have any idea about this sir it is it is okay it's okay for that role okay. that you are giving it because you're not only fighting with that tank tank right. is part of a system so you have you have say zorava you will have medium tanks with them and you will have anti tank weapons with them so it's a part of a system that you're employing there and then uh, india also uh, created a very heavy tank called arjun and uh, that was not very yes. successful apparently well, what was the reasons for that any any thoughts any See, what happened is uh, arjun is uh, a tank which is heavy around 70 tons or so wow and it is it, it is a tank which is uh, which is indigenously developed Right. so every indigenization is is not complete indigenization we still yeah. get engine from germany mtu transmission rank from again abroad and so many things come from outside so it's not as if it's 100% in indigenized but it is largely made in india so it is called the indigenous tank so when we started making it the problem is uh the interfacing between the user and the drdo was not good so armed forces keep kept changing their requirements mm. kept asking for more 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 yeah and it kept on adding to the weight so today the status is we have uh, two regiments and two more are joining them it is used mostly in the desert area where you don't have too many bridges and it can be once put in that sector it is used there. okay well but it's fairly good tank okay seeing how heavy the 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 tank was they they should have called it uh, instead of calling it arjun they should have called it beam <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just, just just putting yeah, it out <laughs> you could have done that you could have done that. right but incidentally t90 is called bishma ah uh, i see okay Uh, okay that's cool uh, just uh, just because one of last potency. right because of its potency aha uh... uh-huh. bishma right mm-hmm. uh what, one last question on this uh, conversation on tanks you know in the war in ukraine uh, now you know the 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 backbone of the russian uh, armor is the t72s and now they have a lot of t90s also being inducted into the war and on the ukrainian side now they're coming up with leopard 2s and the uh, us abrams uh if we were to do a comparative analysis of the leopard 2 abrams versus the t90s are they at the e- are they at an equal footing or would you say the western technologies are better or the russian reliability sort of takes precedent over that how would you compare them see one factor which we just cannot ignore is what how those tanks are used like if if i am asked to comment on this uh, fiasco which russians have you know imposed on themselves putting tanks in one single file and putting them in a miles long you know convoy yeah. and making them sit in ducks over there we never use tanks like this when i joined my regiment i was told the first principle of employment of tanks is dispersion 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 you have to be dispersed so if you were in a horizontal sort of row kind of a formation so minimum distance had to be 800 to 1000 meters okay and the thing we were taught is no two tanks accidentally also should come in the line of same projectile mm. this make it difficult for a person to engage you 
And if you were going in a in a, in, a, in, a, in a column formation, then uh, you again would be staggered, so that you're not in one line. One tank is here, one tank is on the side, third right. is there. So it, it is a staggered kind of a formation. So the uh, one who's engaging you has greater challenge. Now, if I was to recollect one story of since it's your it is a history channel. 1965 war. Yep. Uh, Pakistan was given M48. Patton tanks. Yep. You know, Patton tanks. And patterns that time were the most modern. Americans yep. made them. And India had Centurions and AMXs, which were, you know, obsolescent kind of tanks. Those. It, it was at the end of their life type of thing, British tanks. So now Centurion was a very basic thing. It was outgunned by uh, patents. Patents had uh, very, that time, very modern coincidence range finders, which is uh, two mirrors are placed at the ends of the turret. You are a scientist, so it is lambda, you know, and you keep varying their focal lengths. So, function of focal length into lambda at, at the projected target gives you. Uh, range, right. you know, triangulation kind of thing is achieved. Now, Pakis could never, could never and could never master that because tanks had just been inducted. Right. Whereas our crews brought up what the word that you used, wonderful word, Jugaad. So yeah. what our, our crews did is they decided that you level the gun and you will elevate it half and then you depress it one full circle. So what you're doing is from here, you're going half up, full down, so half here and half here. So you're making a bracket. And this bracket of three rounds was such that no target, if you fire it quickly, no target could be, you know, could be safe in that bracket. It'll be wow. destroyed for sure. And this three round technique, one works in 65 volt. So it'll be, it'll be how you use your tank. But uh, Vikram, I'll agree with you on this fact that uh, T-72s and T-90s have thrown up this challenge that their turret has got this phenomena that if you hit the turret and hull join, then the turret can fly off. Hmm. It's, it's got that weakness. Okay. Oh, yeah. And the second yeah. thing, or second thing is ammunition which is inside. Uh, most uh, Western equipment now puts ammunition outside or in, in what is called uh, called as blow off panels, which are you know like a, which are a sort of a, a pre-planned engineered kind of uh, weakness. So when you have an attack, those panels will first blow off, and that ammunition will effect will go out. It will oh. not get into the Direct. Okay. So in Russian times, you can be, if you are hit, you can be cooked inside, literally. Wow. But the Western times give you better protection because they have these blow up panels. So these are challenges. But uh, when you're fighting, there are now, and then now there is a new animal on in the pack, which is drones, top attack. Yeah. See, yeah. When when you when you design the tanks. Keep down the weight. You have to design as per there is this science which is called directional probability variable theory. Okay. So you see, if you attack, in which arc you'll get maximum attack. So right. that you put 500 millimeter of protection. Okay. Special steel. Okay. Right. And on the side and bottom behind, you put lesser. Much lesser. On top, you put just about 40, 50 millimeter. So now this is a game. Now nah? this is cat and mouse game. So people who have to attack tanks said, "Okay, I will come from top. I'll attack you from top." Right. So drones or incorporate the top. I think uh, in the 
Ukraine war after they saw that uh, you know the, the the drones are attacking from the top and then there's a huge vul vulnerability of those tanks they created an an extension they had those things on top of the tanks to provide yeah. a little bit better protection that's kind of like the Russian jugar but obviously the tanks that they that they had inducted into the war they were they obviously did not take into account the threat from drones because those tanks were from back in the days I, I would imagine that the new tanks that are, that would be coming in would take that into account, and the top part will also be much better protected. See, uh, this idea of tanks when they were fighting in built-up area, not here, in Lebanon and uh, Syria and those areas, mm -hmm. that time Israelis encountered that people would get into windows of houses and lob grenades and all, and mm -hmm. with 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 a rocket launcher destroy a tank. So tanks started incorporating what is called a cage, which is yeah. called TUSK, Turbo, uh, Tank Urban Survival Kit, TUSK, or BUSK, mm -hmm. Built Up Area Survival Kit. Oh. It's, or you put chains, flames, and you use them to sort of create that uh, uh, one minute, one, 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 one minute, sorry, sorry. That's okay. Uh, but, uh, you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. So Perfectly you, cre fine. you create that kind of a protection for yourself. And now we have moved into what is called an active protection system. So you have devices which uh, there are some which are first generation, which generate certain thermal signatures like smoke and all to defeat a pro incoming projectile. And uh, there are better, like Israelis have made something called as Profi, Arena, and these systems have come in first generation by Shatora. So with that, what happens is you fire a small projectile. Right. And you destroy that or you deflect it. Oh, as so, soon as if, if, if there's a... Uh, an attack coming on a tank, it will sort of sense that s something is coming towards the tank and it will just yeah. fire it and then yeah. just before it attack. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And it's very expensive. It's very expensive. It has so to be. It's yeah. a question of how many you are putting, where you're putting, and also tanks have to fight as part of a system. Right. You know, you have to have air defense with us. So if you incorporate and fight it properly, I think you can still, uh, and I would feel that uh, well-trained crews will get better returns out of the same tanks. India cannot throw away uh, so many T-72s or yeah. T-90s. In any case, we should look at our adversaries. Pakistan has also got so many tanks. China yeah. has also got tanks. They're not throwing it away. They'll obviously use it. So with better modifications, better employment of air defense, I think we can find answers and dispersion, yeah. of course. Right. The uh, Speaking of the training of crews of, of the Pakistan army, uh, the incident that you mentioned on the uh, 1965 war, that's the that's from the battle of Kane Karan and Asal Uttar, right? Where the Patent tanks yeah. were completely yeah. demolished. I was yeah. I I I just did my reading on the 1965 war and I was just amazed to see that in that war, Pakistan lost 97 tanks and India lost five. It was such a one-sided battle. It it and all of that, I think most of it goes to the, you know, the excellent training and the of, of the Indian tank crews. Would you say so? And and also and also anti-tank people. Because yes. after all, Abdul Ami was not in a tank. He was fighting right. off a recoilless, you know, gun That's detachment. Right. Right. So it is, and other thing is, uh, in that situation, uh, they were distinctly very foolish or unlucky. They got caught up in the sense, sometimes disaster happened. So right. that disaster happened to them. I, I, think... I, wouldn't, I have a healthy respect for Pakistan army. It's not so bad. Right. You know, uh, the, whatever enemy you have, you feel good if you fight some well-trained enemy. Right. 
yeah. and that's the and so uh, that's uh, one of the uh, weird comments that i get on my youtube channel is like if i say anything positive about the pakistan army then folks you know the nationalists and everything they start coming and saying well how, how do you how dare you say good things about the pakistan army i'm like yeah if the pakistan army is good and we are about we are beating them that makes us look better this and the fact you, you have to tell the facts it's a i mean we were the same army back in the days du during the british time and we've had the same level of training so they are a very uh, worthy uh, opponent or yeah, adversary yeah. you would say that yeah yeah, yeah. We, we work with them in the united nations and see them there mm -hmm. and uh, we, we've not fought a war i've not fought a war with them per yeah. se but uh, we've seen them so to dismiss them will be very tedious you know right. uh, uh, i am not too sure about i feel actually very concerned when i see on twitter and all there are people who say why aren't we going to you know attack pok now <laughs> yes see, uh, you know uh, if pok has to be recaptured you tell me will it be decided on twitter the guys who'll do it will want to achieve a surprise they'll not let you and me get whiff of it they'll right. do it one day you know probably uh, if they if they can do it that surprise is required and the second thing is uh, we should not put pressure unnecessary we don't have to go and fight those people who have to fight a day in day out working out their options right so i was a core commander army commander i would hone those options i would uh, do risk mitigation you can't just launch forces like this you have to see what did uh, musharraf do he launched people in kargil and then i i call it the musharraf folly right you tactically you are okay but strategically it was a bloody mistake right that's that's what they mentioned about the about the kargil war was that uh, tactically it was a brilliant plan because uh, capturing those posts and uh, uh, you know putting the national highway one at risk that was a, a pretty good tactic but there was no strategic outcome that could come out of it it's uh, so yes that that's what they mentioned the ta tactically good strategically pretty bad i wanted to, to sort of come back to that point where uh, you mentioned that you worked with the pakistan army uh, in the united nations is that awkward or how how is the relationship when you work with them is it no uh, you, you you know over there you 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 do not sort of this thing because there's a common enemy right. there is a this thing. so like when chinese camp was attacked in sudan and the uh, indian army went to their rescue mm. okay and we have a fairly good idea the china man is not 10 foot tall right he they the quite chicken out over there. but mm. our army went and saved them even peacekeepers right. so it's not uh, as if in that environment you tend to uh, there is this sense of competition there is a you know like i'll tell you insecurities will always be yeah. like i in angola uh, got friendly with a pakistani civilian official who was a un employee and on 14th of august we were called for a party mm. and on 14th of august we went for that party right. and in angola those parties start late they start all parties start around 10:30 11 right. and carry on till 3 o'clock 4 o'clock so uh, around 12 o'clock uh, two cakes were brought on uh, you know that uh, uh, food tray kind of thing they yep. came one was indian flag and one was pakistani flag yeah. and they said independence day and let's cut cake and they said you such good friends so kj you cut pakistani and uh, tazi his name was mumtaz mumtaz you cut yeah. indian i never thought for one minute i stepped up to do that he caught my hand and he told me in punjabi that let's cut our own only because mm -hmm. there might be a you know so insecurity in their mind is real they are smaller so that mm. is that we have been uh, in a way we are now becoming little aggressive and uh, you know we are waking up to this uh, when we were uh, in peacekeeping and all 
uh, we were in steeped in that era of non alignment and those kind of issues right so uh, world has changed mm -hmm. uh speaking of that point where uh, you where you, your team went and rescued the the, the chinese uh, the chinese regiment over there in the un peacekeeping um they say you know pe people talk about the chinese military might and all of that but it seems like they haven't really participated in they haven't had any conflicts or they haven't had any war that they fought recently uh how would you rate the uh, chinese military since it has not been tested out so if an army or a military has not been tested out is there a possibility that it it may be a paper tiger or how, how would you how would you actually answer this question see, or get into uh, analysis of this see see, see we have a lot of scuffles with chinese pla army right uh, on the lac they they used to happen earlier on like when i was a core commander looking after the team we used to have them regularly so in all those face off are poised it better than chinese mm. chinese also in china has a history where in hong kong and shanghai and other places when britishers ruled china they had recruited sikh policemen and the criteria for recruitment was that a person should be six you know six foot and above ah, and he should be able to carry two no, you know normal people in his armpits you know yeah. press them in armpit right, and like, walk like with this. them yeah right uh, uh, then walk with them so this was the this was the kind of policeman with uh, british used so those things are still in some of their posters history books so they used to they are quite conscious of that now mm -hmm. china has its own challenges like one child family their chinese army has got conscription so you know now but they are better supported in logistics right they are technically a little more advanced mm -hmm. but you can't say that they will they will be they are so much ahead of us tech, technologically but they are little more advanced so and they, mm -hmm. their soldiers are also resilient so for us i don't subscribe to this philosophy that the other man is so weak then by the hell am i you know claiming right. to be another soldier yeah yeah you know i mean am i ever comparing myself with the uh, some army which has got no no you know consequence right chinese army is got its own sense and we have to be aware of that but we should never be intimidated by that because we have seen it um, in a number of situations that they are not 10 feet tall they are normal soldiers they can be tackled right yeah um in terms of technology and, in and, terms of and become like... sorry to sorry to cut you there yes. their capability to take casualties is much lesser than us yeah that's that's what i was i was getting at because we have been we have been sort of put on our toes kept on our toes by all all of the issues that we've had from the pakistan side so the resilience in our soldiers pro probably would be much higher as compared compared to the chinese because they haven't faced all those all those uh, problems and you know it's it's like when when you sort of that becomes a part and parcel of your life you sort of become much stronger uh mentally emotionally so soldier to soldier because of that history i think our our soldiers resilience resilience would be much stronger much 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 strong right okay and uh, just to point out that um when you mentioned about the uh, you know that a lot of folks on twitter are like oh we can go into skardu and all of that that sort of brings me into one of the topics i wanted to discuss was uh um you know the uh the doctrines the the military doctrines that we have versus the pakistan side right uh, we have the doctrine called cold start and pakistan has their own own doctrine that as as soon as indian troops enter into their their territory they'll uh, use tactical nukes if you could talk a little bit about that and sort of explain to the viewers what a doctrine is and mm -hmm. what our doctrine is and 
uh, uh, basically we at one time thought of something called uh, called as cold start doctrine which was that you will this was after you know we realized that we need to you know put it across to them with, before they react okay and uh, but basic objection to that came up even from the government that wars do not start like this mm-hmm. there is certain amount of bombing up before the wars start so practicality of cold start i have always had doubt on mm-hmm. so with, with with huge big formations so then we came out with the concept of integrated battle groups which is don't have huge big formations previously our concept was that you go in into pakistan with two or three armored depth thrusts and put your weight in those strike cores and go deep and create you know such a psychological dislocation in pakistan uh, all those concepts have now got into lot of question can you go so far deep is it possible mm-hmm. it, and and pakistan then as a counter came up with the concept of use of tactical nukes right. now is is it possible to use tactical nukes or is it just a empty threat because in kargil now it was said that after balakot also they are saying pakistan was trying to signal that it wants to use a tactical nuclear strike or something yeah. uh, but there is also school of thought which believes that pakistan does not even have technological capabilities to fashion that kind of a war because miniaturization of warheads and having command and control for that is very very difficult as okay. pakistan achieved it we we, have, we don't have very credible kind of a, a sort of you know confirmation of that so all in all i would see that this is a bluff after balakot we managed to call it off also yep. we we did uh, carve out space for tactic you know for uh, conventional battle below the tactical nuclear threshold by yeah. our selection of target and you know very nuanced kind of you know uh, application we, we did not only go to pok we went to khyber pakhtunkhwa mm-hmm. now pakistan also talks in terms of a new concept of war fighting which is basically that quickly they will try to take this war into hybrid domain they will try and activate hybrid actions now see pakistan all along in 47 they tried what is called kabaili raiders right you know they, they, they it has a it had a religious dimension in that okay. before 65 in 1963 the mysteriously heir of prophet muhammad the holy relic vanished which is called moe muqaddas it vanished mm-hmm. that it was found but 65 also they sent task forces which were named after religious leaders saladin shahin yeah. that is the gibraltar you know, force right the uh, gibraltar force right so they did that and they thought this will in kashmir people will rise and welcome them like what russians thought that when they'll enter ukraine people will be waiting for garlands it didn't happen yeah right it didn't happen at all so 65 was this in 71 was a little different thing though in bangladesh they had used razakars they used those guys okay who were yeah. charged with the religion to kill bang- poor bengalis right and in Kar- in kargil they again gave that cover of mujahideen right they said they are mujahideen so they forever would believe that it's so easy to start a uh, i'm not too sure hybrid element can be started after you have uh, some part of your territory has fallen mm-hmm. and you want to resist that by uprising by cutting their communication lines so what if india does shallow penetrations consolidates and do not go beyond its logistic reach so how would you do that hybrid war so right. all in all uh, 
I look at Pakistan as a country for its existence, it needs India. Right. Because it, it is an anti Indian formulation. Okay. Right. It also has, is tied down with parity syndrome that you want to become equal to smaller brother, wants to be equal to India. It wants to punch much above its weight. It wants to become a leader of Islamic world. It's right. about those, you know, Islamic bomb and trying to become a leader of OIC bloc. It doesn't have the resources for that. Currently, it is in distress. Okay. Right. And, uh, it is also, I, I'm not too sure which Pakistan to address here. Yeah. Like uh, army is following a different line. The public awam is on a, is not, doesn't even have a voice. Right. And like if you see current scenario, uh, Nawaz Sharif and Shahbaz Sharif want to patch up. Imran has been, you know, when they're, they're talking now that 2021, there was some talk starting and there was some thaw and there was some plan that Modi ji will go to uh, Pakistan, do that. Hinglaj Matra, uh, Hinglaj Mata, Navratra there for nine mm -hmm. days. And then, then there will be, a, all this will be done. But then Imran Khan stymied it. Uh, when Pakistan wanted to buy cotton and sugar, again Imran Khan stymied it. I'll just finish in one more minute. Yeah. Uh, currently, when Nawaz and Shahbaz is saying that let's have thought, Imran, one doesn't know which way he's going. And you have this PPP, which is alliance partner of Muslim League. Over there, you have this uh, Bilawan Bhutto and uh, Ina Rabani Khan. Right. Ina Rabani Khan. Those two guys are abusing India. So yeah. it's it, you really don't know which Pakistan to address. You know. You, yeah, they 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 don't have like a. Um... Yeah, everyone's speaking in different languages and you know how they say that uh, most of the countries they have a military pakistan it's a military that has a country it's, uh, it's it, yeah. yeah the country is for the military it's it's the opposite how yeah. it functions in the rest of the world point on the piece that you were talking about was where uh, pakistan wants to punch way above its weight uh yes financially and resource wise it it does not have uh, any, any of those any of the weight that it, it it needs to have to punch above that. Uh, but I would say mi militarily, I think out of all the Islamic world, they are one of the strongest, stronger militaries. Wouldn't you agree with that? Like uh, if you compare it with Turkey, uh, which is in itself is a uh, pretty strong military. Yeah, I would agree to that. They, they, they have been uh, providing security to Saudi palace. They've been training pilots in Jordan and they've yeah. been doing their pilots are quite, uh, they've also been lucky that they, uh, their uh, defense industrial base uh, got uh, handholding by Chinese was, was good. Yep. So they're able to make GF-17s and they're able to make, uh, you know, fighters they're able to make. They've also managed to sell it, sell it to Nigeria, Myanmar and two, three, even symbolically, they've yeah. done that. Uh, Pakistan traditionally has been good in making ammunition and small arms right. or whatever variety. And they have some clientele for that. That is a fact of life. We may keep talking on Twitter, but what is the fact is the fact. And uh, also Pakistan has managed to make al Khalid tank in collaboration with China. They've done right. that. Uh, my take on that is... Uh, I've been, I've written out on, and I've written in my articles also. I've read a uh, opinion of an international expert who is neutral. She's a lady, she is neutral. And she feels that Pakistan has managed to uh, bring up its uh, industrial base, heavy industries, Tachila, aviation complex, Kamra, mm -hmm. and ordnance factories, you know, in, in a much better way. She feels than okay. India. Uh, or also, there is a fact of life that if you you have grown up with army containments and military stations, in in those towns, good mechanics, mysteries, 
Yeah. But many times Muslims, you would have seen it in Mao also, mm-hmm. that your motorcycle mechanic, your scooter mechanic, your painter, your tailors, because whatever it is, they had these skills. So has somehow, and uh, it is, it, I have no way to validate it, but somewhere theology also has been factored in. Okay. Because uh, they managed to do that. See, uh, so all in all, uh, it's a strong army. You can't say it is a, it's a weak army. Even Air Force is good. Only have some asymmetry over them in Navy. Mm, right. uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, we are not in that situation today. Uh, our, our desire was that we should have punitive deterrence against Pakistan. That every mm. time Pakistan wants to do something to us, it's like having a you know spoiled brat in your house and you want to right. give it one back, you know, and the child keeps shut. That yeah, it's like we are. Uh, we have not been able to uh, surgical strike was one attempt yeah. but then somewhere they also managed to shoot down abhinandan's aircraft so right. so somewhere it, you know this thing so we still have miles to go we have to uh, sort of this thing and now the challenge has got magnified because some forces have been rebalanced to chinese border and also yes and collusive threat is also there. Previously, we thought that uh, whenever Pakistan attacks, China will not come in. You know. Right. Now there is a real possibility that both can act in a collusive mode. But hmm. we are catered for all this. I am not saying we have to. We have to be mindful of that. Yeah. So it's the it's it's that fe- it's it's that thought process that people think that oh. Pakistan is a smaller military than us, so so there's no like real threat from it. But in a two front war where China and 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 Pakistan collude and then they attack us at at the same time, that becomes a a, a, a very challenging scenario for the Indian Indian military. But you know, as you said, we've uh, catered for that uh, situation, and we must have we we have forces on both the sides to sort of yeah. block block yeah. those entrances. Speaking and of uh, block apart, uh, achieve our objectives. Achieve Whatever our objectives. objectives we have, uh, we are, but I I can't tell you, and I have no way to tell you because I retired about six seven years back. Right. Uh, I do not know the current status, and I can't tell you that whether in how many how much time we can liberate POK or Gilgit Baltistan. Those are things which current lot knows. Right. Okay. Where do you see the Indian Armed Forces in the next? 10 or, or 20 years. Um, I know there's a lot of reorg that's happening. We are in, investing in a lot of indigenization of our weapons and you know reducing the dependence on, say, other countries like Russia, France, and everything. And just so where do you see our armed armed forces in the next 10, 20 years? Uh, see, we have challenges. Basic biggest challenge is this debate between uh, butter and gun, because uh, right. how much money to give to development, how much to give to defense. Right. Uh, we have those limitations. We are a developing economy, uh, but we are on the correct path. We are doing re- rebalancing. Uh, we are reorganizing also. Uh, we have the genius to be able to do that, and that process is underway. Only thing, there are certain resistances which have to be overcome. So it is hoped that in next few months or uh, next year or so, we'll achieve our desire to do theatrization. Uh, Indian system has got this elephantine, you know, inertia. Uh, It gets, you know, it it starts with a good aim, but then it gets stalled somewhere. And there is a silo-based kind of turf-centric orientation, which has to be broken. But hopefully, we have the willpower. I think we should be able to. And this government has done something wonderful of making a CDS. So right. th- they should take it forward. Yeah. Even Aat Nirbharta is a wonderful concept. But we must, as an informed debate, we should know uh, self reliance is not exclusion. Right. And you cannot, it's not a switch, electric switch that you put it on and 
लाइट आ गया नो इट विल नॉट एपन लाइक दिस इट विल टेक वन और टू डिकेट्स फॉर अस टू बिकम सेल्फ रिलायंट बिकॉज सी लेट लेट मी गिव यू एन एग्जाम्पल ऑफ से शिप अ शिप इज गॉट थ्री कंपोनेंट्स फ्लोट मूव फाइट सो फ्लोट कंपोनेंट रिक्वायर स्टील एंड लेड आउट इन अ कॉन्फिग्रेशन विद बॉयसी सो दैट इट कैन फ्लोट right so that steel or that material about 80% is indigenous but the value chain for that is it is it is it is 15 20% only okay mm. we have achieved 80% indigenous indigenization in that the second component is move which is engines now we don't have the capability to make cast turbine engines we get them from ukraine now we are trying to get them from russia some right. that factory is got destroyed so luckily our engines were lying in russia so we are trying to get it so uh, they were in that process or something is there so in this there is a problem and not only in navy we are not able to make engines for our jet and aircrafts now we are trying to somehow build that capability our helicopter get engines from france some kind of a collaboration Yep, and even tanks, we are not able to make engines of fifteen hundred horsepower or so. We are still getting them from Russia or Germany. So there is a need to make power plants. That capability it will come with hand holding or convincing somebody to make it in India and develop an ecosystem around it. Okay, that is like important thing. And the third thing is fight. Fight is a combination of optronics and weapons. Yeah. now in that we are able to do quite a lot but we still have to get systems and uh, weapons from israel and france so to for us to say that uh, okay 2025 india will be fully autonomous no it will not happen right. it will take time and i call it smart autonomity that means uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel don't make something which is so readily available in the world that you can pick it up of the shelf or it's a technology which is already readily available firstly reduce your critical de- dependencies which is engines and your missile guidance system yeah. and your air defense umbrella reduce those dependencies because they are strategic weaknesses they you can be you know your tail can be twisted on that yeah. they like turkey has got that capability barakhtar it can twist tails right uh, third thing is simultaneously or concurrently uh, steal a march over others if you wish so that you can trade off give you this you give me this that kind of thing so it's a, it's a huge it's a very complex exercise uh, but we have to do it right i think i lost you a little bit in the last uh, one or two sentences 